What's up guys and today I have brought you a one piece what if dot like and subscribe for more anyways let's get on with the what if. Chapter 1. Meeting the Devil, the Logia Brothers are formed. Our story begins on Dawn Island in the East Blue, the weakest and most peaceful of the four blues. On this island we find Vice Admiral, the hero, Monkey D, Garp leading his six-year-old grandson, Monkey D, Luffy, to the home of Curly Dayton, a mountain bandit that Garp has known for years. Garp is entrusting her to raise Luffy whenever Garp himself isn't training his grandson to be a Marine. Why do I have to go to this weird person's house, Grandpa? Luffy asks with a pout as he follows Garp through the forest outside of Fusha village. I've told you already, you brat, there have been reports of a famous pirate crew spotted in the East Blue in the last few months and I don't want you getting any ideas of meeting them. You're going to be a marine just like me, Garp said with a grimace as he bit into a rice cracker. But I don't want to be a marine. I want to be a pirate, Grandpa, Luffy loudly proclaimed with a grin. Garp quickly brought his fist down on Luffy's head sending the six-year-old into the forest floor face first. There is no way any grandson of mine is going to become a pirate, Garp argued as Luffy picked himself up off the forest floor. Luffy responded by sticking his tongue out at his grandpa as they continued on towards their destination. A while later Luffy and Garp arrived at the home of Curly Dayton and her group of bandits. They were greeted by one of Dayton's subordinates and brought in to meet with Dayton. So this is your brat, Garp? Dayton asked as she looked over the small child sitting next to Garp happily stuffing his face with a large piece of meat. This is my grandson, Luffy. Dayton, I need you to look after him for a bit. I'm sure he and Ace will get along quickly, Garp said with a grin. Give me a break, Dayton shouted before sighing. We can barely keep Ace under control and now you want us to raise your grandson too. I bet he's another monster. The bandit leader sighed with a frown. Well, here are your options. You can raise him or spend the rest of your lives in jail, Garp replied with a serious expression. I've overlooked a lot of the illegal things you've done. Fine, we'll take him, Dayton said with a defeated expression. Great, Garp exclaimed with a grin. Luffy, you'll be staying here for a while. There is another boy here that's three years older than you. I'm sure you two can make friends with each other. Okay, Gramps, Luffy said without a care as he tossed the bone, picked clean of meat he'd been eating from away and looked around before looking straight at Dayton. Is there any more meat? he asked with a large grin. What? Dayton shouted as she face faulted into the floor. Boss! The many bandits that worked under Dayton called out as they tried to get their boss to respond to them. The next day Luffy met Ace, their first meeting being less than friendly with Ace spitting on the younger boy. Luffy undeterred by Ace's unwillingness to make friends followed Ace around for three months before finally meeting Ace's friend Sabo at the place known as Grey Terminal. The two older boys eventually came to be friends with Luffy and the three could most often be seen running through the forest or Grey Terminal together. It wasn't until almost eight months later that something unexpected happened. So, Luffy, you're seven now. What should we do to celebrate? Sabo asked as he looked over at his two brothers as the three sat on a small secluded beach hidden by the forest. I want to eat some meat. Luffy replied with a grin as both Ace and Sabo laughed at him. You already do that, Luffy, all the time actually. Ace responded with a grin. When you're celebrating you're supposed to do something special. Special? The only that's going to happen differently is that Gramps is gonna visit today. Luffy replied with his head tilted to the side slightly. Yeah, but hopefully he won't find us for a while if we stay here. Sabo replied as he stood up from the sand and started brushing his clothes off. I'm hungry, though, Luffy said as he stood up as well. Yeah, I am too. I guess we could leave for just a little while to get some meat and stuff, he stated as his stomach growled. Yay! Meat! Luffy shouted with a grin as the three brothers began to walk towards the forest. Hungry are you? came a voice from behind the three boys. All three boys quickly turned around with Ace and Sabo grabbing their trusty metal pipes and holding them defensively in front of themselves while Luffy took a basic fighting stance Garp had taught him during one of his visits over the last year. 
The three boys looked towards the sea and saw an average-looking man wearing long blue shorts and a dark blue shirt with a silver pattern that looked like waves on it. The man had brown hair and sea blue eyes and was holding a small burlap bag in his left hand. He was also standing just out of the sea as water from the tide gently soaked his bare feet. Who are you, bastard? Ace questioned as he held his pipe threateningly towards the newcomer. Sabo and Luffy nodded at Ace's question while not taking their eyes off the man that had seemingly appeared from nowhere. Now, now, I'm just a passerby that happened to hear that three people were hungry. The man replied as he took a step forward. As for my name, I'm called Yumino Akuma. Might I ask your names? The man replied with a calm grin. I'm Luffy. Luffy responded instantly causing both of his brothers to sigh at his simple-mindedness. I'm Sabo. Sabo responded with mistrust in his eyes. I'm Ace. Ace replied with a glare. Now what do you want? As I said, I just happened to be passing by and heard you three say you were hungry. As an adult, I can't just let children go hungry now, can I? The man called Akuma said with a grin as he sat down on the beach sand. I can't say much for this place, but in most places in the world adults that have food share it with hungry children if they meet. Akuma continued as he lifted the burlap bag he was carrying and placed it in front of himself. So you're going to give us the food in that bag? Luffy yelled with a grin as he dropped his fighting stance and was barely restrained by Sable from running straight towards the bag. That's right. Akuma replied with a grin as he opened the bag. What's in it for you, huh? Ace asked while keeping his pipe trained on Akuma while Sabo continued to restrain Luffy. Knowing I prevented three boys from going hungry is all I need. Akuma responded as he reached into the burlap bag. I can't say much for how these things might taste, though. He said as he pulled an odd fruit from the bag and held it up for the three boys to see. All three took notice of the odd fruit in Akuma's hands it was shaped like a papaya but was a light gray color with black swirl markings all over the fruit. So that's it? You don't want money or anything? Sabo questioned as Luffy finally stopped trying to run towards the bag of food. Those fruits aren't rotten, are they? Cause that one looks weird. I promise they're not rotten, but like I said I can't say much for how they'll taste. Akuma replied as he set the strange papaya-like fruit on the sand and reached into the bag for another one. The next fruit he pulled out was orange and red and somewhat resembled the dragon fruit. This fruit also had markings in the shape of swirls on each of the leaf-like parts of the fruit. Akuma set the second fruit down on the sand next to the first before pulling the last one out of the bag. This fruit looked like a small pineapple but was blue in color with yellow swirls covering the fruit. So, can I eat one of those? Luffy asked Sabo and Ace as he stared at the three fruits with some drool coming out of his mouth. I'll eat one first, just to make sure they're not poisoned or something. Ace stated as he slowly walked towards Akuma and the fruits sitting in the sand. Both Sabo and Luffy looked on with worry as Ace picked up the strange-looking dragon fruit. Enjoy, you get to eat a very rare fruit today, Akuma said with a grin as Ace took a small bite of the fruit. Ugh, this thing does taste bad. But it's not as bad as those durian fruit we ate that one time, Ace said as he continued to eat the dragon fruit lookalike. So are they okay? Sabo asked as he and Luffy each walked over and picked up a fruit. Sabo picked up the gray papaya and Luffy took the blue pineapple. Yeah, they're safe I think. Just aren't really tasty. Ace replied as he tossed the small fragment of fruit he had left into the sand. With a nod both Luffy and Sabo bit into their respective fruits. Yuck, I bet these fruits are rare because no one wants to grow them for food. Sabo said as he wolfed down the strange papaya before tossing the small remaining portion he had left into the sand as well. Not good, but it is food. Luffy said as he ate the last bit of pineapple off the core of the fruit and tossed it and the leaves on top into the sand like his brothers. I hope you feel better now that you've eaten. Akuma spoke as he stood up and brushed the sand off his shorts. Ace. Luffy. There you are. Thought you could hide from me, did you? Garp yelled as he came charging out of the forest and onto the beach. Though the instant he laid eyes on the man that was with the three brats he had come to find Garp's face lost all playfulness and grew stone serious instantly. 
Boys, head back to Dayton's place. We're going to have a party to celebrate Luffy's seventh birthday there, Garp said in a no-nonsense tone. All three boys were quick to dash back into the forest in the direction of Dayton's place while Garp continued to stare down Akuma. Only once Garp was sure the boys were gone did he speak again. What are you doing here? Oh, wasn't it a little much to use hockey to enforce that command on the boys? Akuma asked with a grin as he stared back at the vice admiral. If it gets them away from you of all things, then yes. Garp replied as he took a few steps towards Akuma. Now what are you doing here? What did you tell those boys? Garp asked as he cracked his knuckles. Oh, that's not nice, I'm a thing now. Akuma replied with a chuckle as Garp frowned at the man. You and I both know you aren't human, no matter how much you try and look like one. Now answer my question. Garp responded with a growl. Your answer is right by your feet. Akuma said with a dark grin as he looked down at the sand near Garp's feet. Garp looked down and spotted the remains of the three fruits the boys had eaten only a few minutes before. He instantly recognized the marking on the remains of the fruits and looked up at Akuma again. What did you give to them? Garp all by roared as he took another few steps towards Akuma. Logia. Akuma replied simply as if discussing a trivial matter, though the demented grin on his face ruined the nonchalant delivery of the statement. Why? Garp demanded as he was only a few feet from Akuma now and glaring harshly. Why? That's obvious, isn't it? Akuma asked with the same demented grin as his eyes suddenly turned from sea blue with white scara to a demonic yellow with black scara and his teeth changed to resemble fangs. One reason and one reason only, entertainment. I do things like this for the entertainment. I like chaos and disorder. I want to see things blowing up and bodies flying around. I'm not interested in simple day-to-day -day life. I don't care what new taxes the world government puts in place. I don't want to know what country the fucking Tenryubito are visiting. But you show me a large building that's on fire and people start jumping off the roof and I'm a happy guy. I'm amused as hell. I want to see a munitions base explode. I want to see an armada sink. I want to see a Tenryubito die on his birthday. I want to see some guy running through a marine base with a high caliber gun firing at marines. I want to see thousands of people in the streets killing each other. I want to hear about a country collapsing. I want to know about the world government going bankrupt. I want to see people going crazy. Smoke and fire. Explosions and fighting. Exciting shit. That's what I call entertainment. It's just the kind of guy I am. Just the kind of guy I am. Ha 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 ha. Akuma ranted while laughing psychotically as his hands developed claws and the wind started picking up speed. Damn you devil. Garp roared out as his right arm turned black with hockey and he punched Akuma in the face. Only for Akuma's body to break apart into sea water on impact and fly back towards the sea. I'm looking forward to the next few years, Mr. Marine. Akuma's voice said before the wind died down and all was calm on the beach again. Garp stood there enraged before calming down and pulling the small book of known devil fruits from the inside of his jacket pocket to try and identify the fruits the boys had eaten. I'm gonna have to call in that favor Kazan owes me. Garp mumbled to himself as he flipped through the small Logia section of the book that Dr. Vega Punk had published for the Marines. I wonder if Sengoku will let Akiji of all people have a few months off to train the boys if I tell him how they came by their powers? Garp thought out loud as he finally came to a Logia fruit that had similar form, coloration, and markings as the red fruit. Mara Mara no me? Shit, that bastard really gave them Logia of all things. Garp grumbled as he flipped a few more pages before finding a match for the mostly eaten pineapple. Goro Goro no me. Damn, this just keeps getting worse. Garp sighed as he flipped through several more pages before finding the last match. Hi hi no me? Never seen or heard of this one before. But if it's a Logia it's probably destructive in some way. Garp thought before standing up and kicking the remains of the three fruits into the ocean. With his inspection of the fruits done, Garp headed back to Dayton's place to question the boys and celebrate Luffy's birthday. 
There was no reason to worry the boys with the identity of the man they had met, but he had to know if anything else was said to the three boys. Later that night, after celebrating Luffy's birthday, Garp told the three boys what the fruits they had eaten were. The boys were all shocked and asked what power they had gotten. After finding out which boy ate which fruit it was discovered that Ace ate the Mara Mara no Mi and was now a fire human. Luffy had eaten the Goro Goro no Mi and become a lightning human. While Sabo had consumed the Hi Hi no Mi and had now turned into an ash human. Garp promised the boys that he would have someone able to teach them how to control their new powers come to the island in a few weeks, hopefully before they ended up destroying something. After walking back to his marine ship Garp ordered his subordinates not to disturb him as he made a call to Fleet Admiral Sengoku. After a few rings Fleet Admiral Sengoku picked up and spoke. What is it Garp? Even when you take a vacation you find some way to cause me trouble. Sengoku said to the Vice Admiral. We've got a problem, Sengoku. He showed up here in the East Blue. Garp stated seriously followed shortly by a thump from the other end of the line. A few seconds later the sounds of movement could be heard and Sengoku started speaking again. Akuma showed himself in the East Blue of all places. Report now, Vice Admiral. Sengoku ordered. Garp related all the details he'd been told by the boys all the way through the conversation he'd had with Akuma. This is worrisome, Garp. But if all he did was give three boys the power of a devil fruit, even if they are Logia fruits, then we got off light. At least an island wasn't almost completely destroyed by a tsunami this time. Sengoku commented with a sigh already knowing that he was going to have to inform Commander-in-Chief Kong and the Gora CI of this latest appearance by Yumino Akuma. One other thing I'd like to ask of you, Sengoku. Garp said into the Den Den Mushi. What do you want, Garp? Sengoku asked from the other side of the line. I'd like Kuzan to come to Dawn Island and teach the boys how to control their powers before this whole island is damaged or destroyed by accident. Garp requested as he lifted a glass of alcohol to his lips and took a sip. You want me to approve of a marine admiral taking time off to go and train three boys to control their devil fruit powers? Sengoku asked rhetorically. Yes, sir. Garp replied formally. Fine, but you owe me later, Garp. Be glad it's been relatively calm recently so I have no need for all three admirals to be on assignment already. Sengoku responded with a sigh. Garp clearly heard Sengoku start, writing something over the Den Den Mushi. Tell Kuzan that this will clear up that favor he owes me too, would you Sengoku? Garp asks as he pours himself another glass of rum. Fine, I'll tell him Garp. Sengoku, over and out. Sengoku said before hanging up the Den Den Mushi. While waiting for Admiral Akiji, also known as Kuzan, to arrive, Garp started instructing the boys on how to control their devil fruit powers as best as he could. Not having any powers himself but working with dozens of fruit users over the years, Garp did a fairly good job. By the end of two weeks, all three boys could keep themselves in normal human state and had the basic ability to produce small amounts of their respective elements. At the beginning of the third week, Garp took all three boys down to the docks of Fusha village to greet their devil fruit teacher. When is he gonna get here, Gramps? Luffy asked bored as he kept looking out at the ocean. He'll be here soon enough, Luffy, be patient. Garp responded for the third time with a sigh. What's that on the ocean? Sabo questioned as all four people turned to look at where he was pointing. Heading towards them was what appeared to be a man on a bicycle. The man was very tall and was wearing a white vest over a purple shirt and white pants. He had black hair and was literally riding a bike on the ocean. That's so cool! Luffy shouted as sparkles filled his eyes while the man got closer and closer to the docks. It's kinda weird too, Ace said while watching the tall man get closer. The man quickly rode his bike onto the island shore and got off before propping the bike up against the nearest building. Boys, allow me to introduce you to your new sensei for a while. This is Admiral Akiji, one of the strongest men the Marines have to offer. Garp announced when Akiji stood in front of the four of them. Nice to see you again, Garp. Kuzan greeted before looking over the three boys he would be training until they could properly control their new powers. You're really tall. Luffy yelled while staring up at Kuzan. Super tall. 
Sabo commented as he also looked up at the admiral. Freakishly tall, Ace said with a frown as he looked at their new teacher. Hey, hey now. If you call me freakish, none of the beautiful women on this island will hang out with me. Kazan said while Gark just sighed at the lazy admiral. You're not here to date the local women, Kazan. Garp reminded with a sigh. You're here to train these three to control their powers. All right, all right, no need to get excited. Kazan replied as he took another look at his three new students. But let's start tomorrow. For now I think I'll get a room at the local inn. Then I'll visit the local pub and see if I can't find a nice lady to talk to. The lazy marine finished as he walked his bike into town. He's kinda weird. Luffy, Sabo, and Ace said in unison while looking at Garp. This is gonna take a while. Garp said to himself as he had Ace, Sabo, and Luffy follow him to Makino's pub for some dinner. Chapter 2 Logia Training with an Admiral The day after Garp had introduced Kazan to the three boys Ace, Sabo, and Luffy were dragged out of bed by Garp just after dawn, with much complaining from all three of the boys in the process. Grandpa! I wanna sleep! Luffy grumbled out as he stood in an open field far away from Fusha village. Yeah, why do we have to be up so early? Sable questioned while rubbing his eyes sleepily. Old jerk, waking us up so early. Ace muttered to himself as he yawned loudly. All of you be quiet. We're just waiting for Kazan to show up so he can start your training. Garp replied with a growl as he glared at the three boys. However, after waiting for almost half an hour, Garp lost his patient tense and used Sar to quickly dash back to Fusha village and check up on the tardy admiral. Needless to say, Garp was less than amused to find the perpetually lazy admiral still asleep in his bed at the inn. Garp frowned heavily before grabbing Kazan by his right leg and bodily throwing him out of the second-story window. Get up, you lazy brat! Garp roared as Kazan went sailing out the window. In a testament to his skill and prowess as an admiral, Kazan landed on his feet outside wearing white pajama pants and a long-sleeved purple t-shirt. Hmm? I'm up, I'm up. Kazan stated as he pushed his sleeping mask up onto his forehead and gave a loud yawn. You were supposed to be at the field north of the village thirty minutes ago. Garp yelled at Kazan as he landed from jumping out of the inn's window. Oh? Is it that time already? Kazan wondered as he scratched the side of his head. It's a little too early for me. He remarked with another yawn as he headed back towards the inn. No, you don't. Garp growled that he grabbed Kazan by the back of his shirt and dragged the tall man all the way back to the field with several bursts of soru. When the two arrived they found all three boys playing sword fight with some sticks they found. Kazan took in the scene with amusement on his face while Garp's eyebrows started twitching in frustration. Get over here and pay attention, you brats! Garp barked at the three boys. Ace, Sable, and Luffy reluctantly dropped their sticks and walked over to the two marines. If you three want to control your new powers you need to listen to Kazan starting now. Garp said to the three boys before taking several steps back and sitting down to watch the boys' first lesson. Hmm, well I guess we should start with learning some names. Kazan stated with a sigh as he pointed to each boy and rattled off their names. Ace, Luffy and Sabo, correct? All three boys nodded surprised the lazy admiral had actually remembered their names from last night at dinner. Before I start trying to teach anything I need you three to show me what you can do already. Kazan explained while watching the three boys nod. All right, I guess I'll go first. Ace said as he stepped forward and held up his right hand. In a few moments Ace's hand turned a bright, hot red before flames appeared in his palm. Kazan nodded at the display prompting Ace to turn his hand back to normal. Ace stepped back as Sabo stepped up to go next. Here I go, Sabo said before both of his hands turned black and dispersed into two small clouds of ash with reddish embers swirling around. Once Kazan nodded in recognition Sabo reformed his hands and walked back to stand by Ace and Luffy. My turn, my turn! Luffy called out with a huge grin before putting both of his hands about a foot apart. With a look of concentration on Luffy's face small sparks of lightning began moving between his two hands in a constant stream of electricity. When Kazan also gave him a nod Luffy stopped the sparks and jumped back towards his brothers. 
All right, I see you all have the basic ability to call forth your powers. Can you become your elements completely yet? Kazan asked before a yawn escaped his mouth. Grandpa taught us to remain in human form so we didn't accidentally damage things. Luffy replied while Ace and Sabo nodded in agreement. I see. Well then our first little lesson will be getting you comfortable with shifting between your solid human body and your elemental state, Kazan said as he walked further out into the dusty field. I'll demonstrate first so you can see what I'd like you to accomplish. Within a second Kazan's whole body had turned into solid ice and the ground around his feet froze over from the intense cold. This is my high high no me power, I'm an ice human. I want you three to be able to turn into your respective element just as quickly as I did. Once you can freely shift between these two states then we'll move on to the next lesson. Kuzan explained as he walked towards Garp and laid down to watch the three boys try and shift themselves into their element. I bet you guys I'll be the first one to do it. Luffy said to his two brothers with a grin as he held up his right fist. You're on little brother. Sabo replied with a grin as Luffy pouted and stuck his tongue out at Sabo. I'll beat both of you. I am the oldest brother after all. Ace told them with a smirk as he ran off to the other side of the field to start trying. Sabo and Luffy both ran off in different directions to start practicing too. Ace started by trying to force his whole body to ignite at the same time, though this method worked for his arms, torso and head he couldn't get his legs and feet to ignite at the same time as the rest of his body. Sabo tried a different method slowly working his way up from his hands he was able to turn his forearms, upper arms, head and torso into a swirling cloud of ash and was slowly working his way down to his waist and legs. Luffy was simply discharging electricity all over his body trying to make his body become the lightning, though simply discharging the lightning wasn't going to do that but it was helping Luffy with calling forth his element freely so his idea wasn't a total waste. It was nearing dinner time before the boys had finally been able to transform into their elements completely. The three boys had only stopped for a short lunch around midday before going right back to training each boy still trying to beat the other two by being first to complete a full conversion. It was just an hour or so before dinner when Sabo had managed a complete transformation from head to feet. Ace and Luffy both grumbled about losing before trying to beat each other to second place. Ace accomplished his full conversion next by starting from his feet and changing his body as the flames climbed higher rather than trying to get the flames to burn downwards from his arms to his head and torso. Luffy, after seeing both his brothers beat him at the change got frustrated and accidentally transformed as he let his powers flow outward without restraint. This did have the rather amusing effect of sending Luffy across the entire length of the field as a flash of lightning which stopped only when Luffy hit the ground and the lightning dispersed into the ground. Well, you three finally got a full change down, Kazan said with a yawn as he approached the three boys. Of course it took you all far too long to make the change, but we'll work on speeding up your shifting during the next lesson. The admiral finished before turning around and heading back towards Fusha village with Garp. Come on, boys, time for dinner. Garp called as he walked with Kazan towards the village quickly followed by the three hungry children. The next day. All right, now that you three can change into your elements at will, we need to work on the speed you can change at. Kazan drawled lazily while sitting in front of the three boys in the field again. Why do we need to be able to change as fast as you? Sabo questioned as he held back a yawn of his own. One of a Logia user's greatest abilities is being able to dissolve or otherwise become intangible to most forms of attack by shifting into their element. If you can't change fast enough any attack could potentially be fatal. Kuzan explained to the three boys before Garp's leg quickly kicked the head off the tall admiral's shoulders. All three boys cried out in shock at what Garp had done before they realized that there was no blood. In fact where Kuzan's head had been separated... The only thing the boys saw was his neck made from ice. Kuzan's head rapidly reformed from the icy stump of his neck before returning to normal. This is what I was talking about. Kuzan stated while the boys looked towards the severed head and found only small pieces of broken ice. That's so cool. Luffy exclaimed with sparkling eyes. I understand now. Sabo stated with a nod. That could definitely be useful. Ace said looking between the shattered ice and Kazan. 
Now to save me some time and trouble I'm going to incorporate your speed shifting training into your instinctive shifting training. Kazan explained with a yawn. What's instinctive shifting? Ace questioned with confusion at the new term. What I just demonstrated is known as instinctive shifting. By sensing an incoming attack you shift instinctively into your element to avoid the attack. If you sense the attack but can't change fast enough it's just a waste. Kazan replied as he laid back into the grass. Garp will help you three get this down over the next week or two. Kazan stated as he put his sleep mask over his eyes. What's Grandpa going to do? Luffy questioned before a pebble smacked into his forehead at high speed sending the seven-year-old onto his butt. Ow. Oh, that hurt. Luffy exclaimed while Ace and Sable looked around trying to figure out where the pebble came from. You should have shifted faster. Garp called out from the other end of the field. Grandpa, you jerk. Luffy yelled out only to have another pebble smack him, this time in the stomach. Ace and Sable both found themselves struck by pebbles as well causing all three boys to run around trying to dodge the pebbles they could barely see or hear before they were hit. Two weeks later, Sabo, Ace, and Luffy are walking through the field they've been using for their training for the last two weeks as dozens of pebbles and even some larger rocks fly through the air at them from multiple directions. The various stones simply pass through each boy without the boys seeming to notice. After several minutes of this the stones stop flying and the boys are approached by Kuzan and Garp. Seems like you boys finally got the hang of instinctive shifting. Garp said with a grin while Sabo and Ace glared at him and Luffy had his customary large grin. Evil old man. Sabo muttered while glaring at Garp. Stupid jerk, thinks he's funny. Ace growled while increasing his glare. Both reactions only caused Garp to laugh at the two boys, while Kazan looked on mildly amused. Now that you can instinctively shift and dodge attacks that you can see and hear coming we'll move on to the next lesson. Kuzan stated as he walked around the boys to get in front of them. What else is there to learn besides how to fight with our powers? Now that we can instinctive shift we're practically unbeatable, right? Ace questioned with his arms crossed. Kuzan launched a kick at the ten-year-old, at about ten percent of his actual combat speed, allowing Ace to see the incoming kick in time to shift. Kuzan's kick connected and sent Ace several feet backwards where the boy landed on his back. You were saying? Kazan asked with a serious look on his face. Ack. Cough how did you cough hit me? I'm fire. Ace questioned through a coughing fit as he tried to get air back into his lungs. Both Sabo and Luffy just stood in shock at seeing Ace get hit while he'd been able to shift. That's part of the next lesson. Kazan explained with a yawn. Logia users often feel invincible but they can be hit in a number of ways. For example an element that is contradictory to your own, like water to fire, or if your opponent can use hockey, like I just did against you. What's hockey? Sable asked the question all three boys were thinking. Hockey is the force of your will and spirit. It can empower the body or a weapon with training. It is one of the only surefire ways to effectively combat devil fruit users. Garp explained as he flicked both Luffy and Sabo in the forehead. Ouch. Grandpa. Luffy cried out as he held his forehead. Sabo kept quiet but still held his head in pain. Furthermore hockey can be divided into three categories. Busashoku or armament hockey, Kanbunshoku or observation hockey, and Haushoku or conqueror's hockey. Haushoku hockey can't be trained and occurs only in one in every one million people or so. But anybody can train and master Kanbunshoku or Busashoku hockey which we'll be teaching you the basics of. Once you've got the basics down, the only thing that will let you get any better with hockey is experience. Garp explained before a grin spread across his face as he held up three blindfolds. Training begins now. One month later. Luffy, I think I hate your grandpa. Sabo said as the three surrogate brothers continued to spar with Garp while blindfolded and using armament hockey to fight back instead of their devil fruit powers. Grandpa is kinda mean. Luffy agreed as he sensed a punch from Garp and leaped back to dodge only to be kicked in the stomach by Garp's follow-up attack. He's a stupid old man. Ace said as he launched a punch with his armament hockey active, a vague transparent haze seeming to surround the ten-year-old's fist, 
Garp simply knocked the punch aside before trying to flick Ace in the forehead. Ace ducked backwards to dodge the flick while Sable launched a kick at where he sensed Garp was going to move, only to get punched as Garp dodged the kick and counterattacked. Suddenly an alarm clock rang and all three boys dropped to the ground exhausted. Look at that, you boys lasted the whole sparring time again. That's seven days in a row now. Garp said happily with a smile while the boys took off their blindfolds. Slave driver. Ace muttered as he crawled towards the lunch basket Garp had brought with them this morning. Taskmaster. Sabo grunted as he also tried to crawl towards the lunch basket. Food. Luffy called out weakly as he quickly crawled his way towards the basket. After lunch Kazan had the boys take a nap for an hour, supposedly so they would be well rested for the next stage of their training, though all three, plus Garp, knew it was because the Admiral was being lazy again. After the hour nap the boys did feel more relaxed and rested and promptly woke Kuzan up by nudging him repeatedly until the Admiral sat up and started explaining. All right, all right the next stage of your training is to teach you how to fight effectively with your devil fruit powers. Just throwing your element around will only get you so far before someone with better technique takes you down. I'll demonstrate a few of my techniques and maybe you'll get some inspiration for your own techniques. Kuzan explained as he got up to show a few of his techniques to the boys. Ice block, partisan. Kuzan said as three trident-shaped pole arms formed from ice in front of him and were quickly launched towards one of the few large rocks near the edge of the field. The three projectiles smashed into the rock leaving behind large gouges wherever they struck the large stone. Wow! Luffy said in awe as his eyes sparkled. Sabo and Ace couldn't help but agree. That attack had been awesome. Ice block, pheasant beak. Kuzan announced as his entire right arm turned to ice and a large bird of ice formed and raced towards the same large rock. This time, however, the rock was completely obliterated by the admiral's attack. Giant ice bird. Luffy yelled happily, his eyes practically glowing with excitement. What the heck? That was huge! Ace and Sabo exclaimed at the same time. Both boys shocked by the amount of ice Kazan could create in an instant, and the power behind his technique. One more and then I'll let you try and come up with your own ideas for techniques. Kazan stated as he walked over to a large tree at the edge of the field. He placed his hand on the tree's trunk before announcing his attack. Ice time! The large tree was quickly frozen solid as the boys watched on. Freaky, a tree cycle. Ace said as the three brothers looked at the frozen tree. Do you think it tastes any good? Luffy questioned while looking at the tree. Idiot. Sabo muttered to himself while face palming. Now you three try and come up with some techniques of your own. Try and think of the attributes of your respective element while you come up with your moves. Kuzan instructed as he sat down away from the frozen tree. Oh. I know. Luffy exclaimed channeling lightning around his arm. Lightning block! Pheasant beak! He yelled throwing his arm forward but only succeeding in sending a lightning bolt into the sky. Ah, uh, why didn't it work? Luffy pouted as he looked at his hand. Hmm, let me try something. Ace said as he brought flames from his body in front of him. Fire block! Partisan! He yelled but only succeeded in sending a wave of fire a few dozen feet in front of himself. Okay. This is harder than it looks, Ace admitted. Boys, you can't just try and copy my techniques. My techniques are formed from ice, a solid element. Trying to solidify lightning or fire may take you quite a while considering neither are naturally solid. It might even be impossible, Kuzan explained from where he was sitting. So we don't have to say fire block or ash block to make techniques like yours work? Sabo asked as he turned his left hand into ash watching the red-orange embers swirl inside the cloud. Of course not. I came up with ice block when I was younger and had only recently started developing my powers and techniques. It helped me focus and often led to having better results from my techniques. If you want to come up with something that will help you concentrate, that's fine. Hell, I'd recommend it. But it should be something that helps you focus. Kazan replied before yawning lightly. I see so something that helps me to focus. Sable muttered while he began thinking deeply. I'll have to think about that for a while. Ace said as he started walking around slowly. I have no idea. 
Luffy commented with a large grin as both Sabo and A's face palmed. The next day. So what did you three come up with? Kuzan asked from his position laid back on the ground. Me first. Me first. Luffy said with a grin as he bounced around. Go ahead, Luffy. Kazan replied which caused Luffy to grin even bigger. Goro Goro no pistol! Luffy exclaimed holding up his right hand like a gun his index and middle fingers extended. From the tips of Luffy's fingers a thin, but bright bolt of lightning shot forward and pierced the still frozen tree leaving a hole about an inch wide straight through the tree. Simple, but effective. Seems you've found what works for you, Luffy. Kuzan commented as Luffy was congratulated by his brothers. I'll go next, Ace said with a smirk. And Kai, Hibashira. Ace waved his arms around bringing forth large amounts of fire before launching a huge stream of fire directly into the air above him. The pillar of fire reached a height of fifty feet before it dispersed. Not bad, seems you need focus for larger attacks. Small ones seem to come to you much easier. Kuzan stated having seen Ace play with small balls of flame like they were toys when they took breaks from their training. Well, I guess it's my turn then. Sabo announced with his own grin. Ash make, darts! Sabo's hands both turned into large clouds of ash from which several dozen black spike-like darts were launched before stabbing into the ground in front of Sabo for at least thirty feet. That's also good, Sabo. Kuzan responded as he picked up one of the darts from the ground. This thing feels like incredibly dense charcoal. So you compress your ash together until it's solidified? Kuzan questioned while examining the dart. Yep, that's why I used ash make as my focus command. Turning my ash into objects is a lot different than when I use it freely as a large cloud or wave. So the word make helps me focus on giving it a form. Sabo explained as he reformed his hands and returned them to normal. That was great! Gark shouted from the edge of the field, surprising everyone. I knew you boys could do it. You'll all be great marines one day, he said with a laugh as he walked towards the group. I don't want to be a marine, Grandpa. I want to be a pirate, Luffy yelled back. Yeah, I'd rather do what I want than what I'm told, Ace replied with his arms crossed. I enjoy being free and doing what I like. Besides, marines take orders from snooty nobles. Sabo commented with a frown. You'll all be marines and like it. Garp yelled back before calming down and turning to Kazan. Sengoku needs you back, Kazan. Says he needs an Anmaro's presence back at headquarters for one of the monthly report and review meetings. Ah, man. Those are so boring. I was hoping to have a longer vacation. Kazan replied before he turned and started walking with Garp back towards Fusha village. One hour later. Well, looks like this is goodbye for now, boys, Kazan said as he stood before Garp's ship which would take both the Admiral and Vice Admiral back to Marine Headquarters. Keep practicing your skills and powers and you'll go pretty far in this world no matter what you decide to do. Sure thing, Sensei. Luffy, Sabo and Ace replied together before looking towards the opposite bay, where all the residents' boats came and went from, when they heard someone scream. The reason for said scream was that the Sea King— known to the local people as the Lord of the Coast was rising up from the water in the middle of the bay with a loud roar. Man, can't even get a peaceful send-off from your home island, can I garp? Kuzan asked rhetorically as he, garp and the three boys walked towards the other bay's shoreline. Once the group arrived the Sea King turned to look towards them and let out another roar. Here's one last thing I want you boys to think about when you get stronger, Kuzan said as he stepped forward and put his hand into the sea. Every competent devil fruit user usually has one or two attacks that are so powerful they only use them when a situation calls for it. The Sea King was by now swimming quickly towards the group on the shore with its mouth of razor shark teeth open wide. You three are a bit young to be able to bring out that much power yet, but I have no doubt that you all will be capable of it one day. Kazan continued Eve as the Sea King was getting closer and closer but for now I'll let you see the kind of technique and power I'm talking about. He finished with the Sea King no more than twenty feet away from him now. Ice Age! Kazan exclaimed and in that instant everything froze. No way! Ace said dumbfounded. Impossible! 
Sabo commented with his eyes as wide as possible. So cool! Luffy yelled as his eyes sparkled. The Sea King, the ocean and even parts of the shore were completely frozen in place. The temperature had noticeably dropped several degrees and the Lord of the Coast was frozen solid mid-lunch. All right, I guess we should set sail now, Kuzan said as he and Garp started walking back towards Garp's ship, leaving the boys to stare in awe at the level of power they could someday wield. Chapter 3 Meeting a Yanku, Dreams Are Made Almost two months had passed since Kazan and Garp had left the three brothers to return to Navy headquarters, and we find the trio at Makino's pub in the, once again, quiet town of Fusha village. Well, not so quiet in the last few days, since a band of pirates under the command of Red-Haired Shanks, one of the Yanku of the New World, had docked at Dawn Island. What would this infamous band of powerful pirates be doing in the East Blue of all places? They were partying wildly in the local tavern with the three brothers. At the bar of the tavern the three boys Luffy, Sabo, and Ace are sitting next to Shanks, the captain of the red-haired pirates. Red-haired. Shanks is a man of average height wearing a button-down long-sleeved white shirt, black pants with a sash holding them up and sandals on his feet. There are three vertical scars over his left eye and a straw hat over his dark red hair, hence his nickname. The reason for the celebration was another successful adventure of the crew and finding a new temporary base of operations on Don Island. These guys are so cool! Luffy exclaimed with his signature grin as looked at the pirates partying in the pub. They're definitely more fun than your grandpa, Luffy. Sabo replied with his own grin as he downed his drink and set the empty cup on the bar. That doesn't take much. Ace commented as he shoved the last piece of his steak into his mouth and then turned around on his bar stool to look at the group of pirates. Glad you kids think so, said Shanks with a grin before he chugged a bottle of sake, burping after he finished the bottle and then laughing like an idiot. I want to be a pirate too. Next time bring me out to sea, exclaimed Luffy in the voice of a child ready for an adventure. You can't handle being a pirate. Being unable to swim is a pirate's greatest weakness retorted Shanks while sporting a knowing smile on his face, thinking back to when he first wanted to become a pirate. Luffy, with a ticked-off look on his face shot back. As long as I stay on the ship I'd be fine. Besides my fighting is really good too. I've been training my whole life and my punch is stronger than a pistol. Luffy finished with a proud grin on his face. He's not wrong, you know. Sabo spoke up as he looked towards Shanks. All three of us were trained into the ground by Luffy's grandpa. I doubt there's much worse out on the sea than that old jerk. Ace agreed as he scowled at the memory of Garp's training. Shanks seemed skeptical at all three of the boys' high opinion of themselves, and his crew wasn't helping the matter by telling them how awesome the life of a pirate is. Luffy listened enthusiastically, his eagerness only increasing as the pirates continued to talk. Shanks tried to act as the voice of reason by telling the brothers that they were still too young to live the life of a pirate, which Luffy heatedly denied while Ace and Sabo scowled at the captain for looking down on them. Don't be mad, here have some juice, Shanks said with a mischievous smile. Luffy thanked the pirate and drank the juice down with his usual childlike enthusiasm. As soon as Luffy was done with the juice Shanks could no longer hold it in and burst out laughing. You really are a kid! That's too funny. What kind of pirate drinks juice? He gasped out between bouts of laughter. That was a dirty trick. Luffy cried indignantly as he watched Shanks laugh at his expense. Sabo and Ace simply sighed at their little brother's simple-mindedness. Luffy left the bar table in a huff muttering about the unfairness of it all when he noticed Shanks' first mate, Ben Beckman, make a come-here motion while lighting up a cigarette. Luffy, while I understand that you're upset, you should try to understand the captain's feelings, the first mate said between puffs of smoke. Seeing the small boy's confused expression, Ben explained, While the captain knows that being a pirate is interesting, he also knows that the life of a pirate is hard and very dangerous. You understand? He's not purposely teasing your ambitions of being a pirate. I don't understand, Luffy replied in irritation. Shanks just takes me for an idiot. Looking in said man's direction, Luffy noticed Shanks stifling his giggles about the prank he just pulled. 
See? Luffy shouted while pointing an accusing finger in Shank's direction. The kid might have a point. Ben thought with a sweat drop seeing his captain still chuckling at his prank. A distraction from the prank came when Makino asked Luffy if he wanted something to eat. Never one to pass down food, especially food of the meat variety. Like the steak Makino was presenting Luffy eagerly plopped down next to Shanks and dug into the plate of meat. Luffy then asked how long the pirates would be staying and, after finding out they would be staying for the rest of the year, promised Shanks that he would convince him to take him along by that time. Ace and Sabo both laughed at their brother's determination to join Shanks on an adventure causing Luffy to yell at them, which only made his older brothers laugh harder. Suddenly the tavern's door was kicked open by a man who looked like one of the dirtier mountain bandits from around M.T. Corvo. Eyeing the pirate seated around the bar, the obvious bandit made a snarky comment on the pirate's appearances despite the fact that he was obviously outnumbered fifty to one against superior opponents. Everyone was looking at the poor excuse for a bandit wondering what he thought he would gain by making such an entrance. The man walked up to the bar and introduced himself as Higuma and then demanded ten barrels of sake for him and his men. When Makino told him that her supply of sake was sold out, the bandit leader frowned and looked around the room. Oh, that's strange. What are they drinking then? Is it water? Higuma asked with a scowl. No, it's sake, but it's all we had. Makino explained to the bandit. Sorry about that, said Shanks trying to defuse the situation. It seems like we finished off all the sake here. But if you don't mind, why don't you take the last bottle? He offered while holding up the unopened bottle of sake. Higuma promptly smashed the bottle sending sake splashing all over the pirate captain, much to the shock of Luffy, Ace, Sabo and the others present in the bar. Most likely they were shocked at the audacity of the bandit insulting someone who so far outclassed him. Higuma went into a small rant on how he was the top fugitive around the area and how his head was worth eight million berry. Shanks simply ignored the man in favor of cleaning up the newly created mess on the floor. Higuma, seeing that he was being ignored unsheathed his sword and proceeded to smash all the glassware on the bar right on top of Shanks. With a few more condescending words, the bandit leader stormed out of the tavern. As Makino checked on Shanks to see if he was all right which he assured that he was, the rest of the pirate crew started cracking jokes on what just happened, with Shanks joining in on the laughter. The only people not laughing, however, were Luffy, Sabo and Ace. Why are you laughing? Luffy shouted while looking angry. Seeing Shanks' puzzled expression, Luffy continued, That was disgraceful. Why didn't you fight him? So what if they have more people? Who laughs after getting picked on? You're not a man and not a pirate either. Shanks paused for a moment before saying, Look, Luffy, I know how you feel, but it's just a bottle of sake. There's nothing to get worked up about. You still didn't have to take that. Sabo stated with a frown as he looked between Shanks and Luffy. Yeah, you could have sent him running with his tail between his legs at least. You wouldn't have even had to throw a punch. Ace commented with a scowl while looking at the doors Higuma had left through. Luffy didn't like Shanks' answer and was heading towards the door in a huff. Come on, don't go, Luffy. Shanks sighed as he reached out to touch Luffy's shoulder. Shanks quickly pulled his hand back with a grimace when he received a painful shock. All the pirates in the bar were staring at Luffy in surprise as sparks of electricity danced around the boy's body. Luffy, what is this? Shanks asked, though he had a very good idea already. Why should I tell you, you're just a coward? Luffy replied with a grumble as he turned away from Shanks. Luffy, did you eat a fruit that looked sort of like this? Lucky Roo asked as he held up an open treasure chest that had a purple fruit with black swirl-like markings on it resting inside. Yeah, he did, but he wasn't the only one. Ace spoke up as he turned his hand into flames and Sabo turned his hand into a swirling cloud of ash. All three of you... You've all eaten of the devil fruit? Shanks questioned the brothers as Ace and Sabo's hand returned to normal and sparks of electricity stopped jumping off of Luffy's body. So what if we did? We've already been trained in how to use them. Sabo replied as he and Ace moved to stand beside Luffy. Nothing bad. Shanks replied with a smile. 
It's just really rare to encounter a devil fruit in the East Blue, much less three of them. He explained as he went to sit back down at the bar. Luffy's grandpa said the same thing. Sabo said as he and Ace pulled Luffy back towards the bar and all three sat back down on their bar stools. What are you guys going to do with the one you have? Ace questioned while looking at the chest containing the devil fruit that Lucky Roo had set on the end of the bar. Not sure yet, Shanks replied as he looked back at the boys. We could save it and see if a future Nakama wants to eat it. Or we could sell it for a lot of money, he explained with a look towards the chest. How much is a devil fruit worth? Sabo asked as he looked at the chest as well. Any devil fruit can easily sell for 100 million berry even if you don't know what power it holds. There are always buyers hoping to get an incredible power from an unknown fruit. But any fruit that has been identified can easily be sold for 150 million berry or more depending on which one it is. Shanks explained as he patted the lid of the closed treasure chest. Is that enough money to buy a life-size bronze statue of me? Luffy questioned with sparkles in his eyes and a big grin on his face. Both Ace and Sabo sighed at their brother's stupid idea. Though Luffy didn't really have a grasp of the value of money, maybe it was something Makino could teach him the two brothers thought as Shanks and the rest of the pirates laughed at Luffy's question. Luffy with 150 million berry you could melt the coins down and make a solid gold statue of yourself. Shanks laughed as he smacked the bar top repeatedly. Though the world government would get pissed if they found out you melted down their currency. Awesome! Luffy responded his eyes sparkling even more at the thought of a solid gold statue. So which devil fruit do you have in the chest? Ace asked after all the pirates had stopped laughing. This is the Gomu Gomu no Mi. Whoever eats it has their body gain all of the properties of rubber. They'd be able to stretch, twist, expand, and probably be resistant to electricity like Luffy's power. Shanks replied as he drank a glass of water Makino had placed down for him. I like my power better. Ace commented as he lit his index finger on fire for a moment before putting it back out. The party quickly resumed with the three brothers showing off small tricks they could do with their powers much to the enjoyment of the pirates. The party lasted until late in the evening with many of the pirates passing out on the floor of the pub for the night. Ace, Sabo, and Luffy were taken to the back and put into a makeshift bed by Makino so they'd be comfortable during the night. Time skip, a few months later. Luffy, Ace, and Sabo were having lunch at Makino's pub after practicing with their hockey and devil fruit powers all morning when a familiar and unwanted person made their entrance into the pub. Well, looks like the pirates aren't here this time. Place smells better without them, at least. Higuma muttered as he led his men into the pub and sat down at a table. Hey, woman, get a sake and keep it coming. He shouted as Makino quickly moved to start serving drinks. After several rounds of booze, Higuma started blathering on about Shanks and his crew calling them cowards and fools. During this time, Ace and Sabo had to restrain Luffy from attacking the bandits. Hey, woman, why don't you show us some skin? questioned a bandit as Makino walked past him to refill Higuma's glass. All the other bandits started cheering at the thought of seeing the pretty bartender's body. That's not a bad idea. Higuma agreed with a laugh as Makino poured his drink with a barely suppressed scowl. That's enough out of all of you. Sabo growled his hockey coming forth and projected towards the bandits causing them to start to sweat in fear. Leave and never come back. Ace added as he let his hockey loose as well. All the bandits started to back away from the two boys at the counter more afraid than they'd ever been before and not able to understand why. Oh, and who is going to make us? You kids? Higuma laughed as he smacked Makino's ass causing the bartender to growl in anger. You jerk! Luffy yelled as in the blink of an eye he'd crossed the distance between the bar and Higuma's table and punched the bandit so hard he flew out the front door and landed in the street. The other bandits stared in shock at the sight of their leader being sent flying by a kid before quickly running out of the pub and heading back towards the mountain screaming about monster kids. You little brat! Higuma yelled at Luffy as the boy walked out of the bar and into the street to face the bandit leader. Ace and Sabo stood in the doorway of the pub to watch their little brother beat the bandit into the dirt. I'll make you pay for what you did to Makino, you jerk. Luffy growled as he walked towards Higuma. 
Like hell you will, you little bastard. Higuma replied as he sent a kick at the young boy. Luffy's observation hockey let him see the move coming before Higuma had even started the motion so he moved back a half step causing the kick to miss. What? Higuma questioned when his kick failed to hit the boy. He quickly threw a punch only for Luffy to dodge his fist by an inch. Higuma tried several more punches and kicks all of which Luffy dodged with the smallest of movements causing the bandit leader to become angrier. Stay still, damn it! Higuma yelled as he reached for his sword. Okay. Luffy responded as Higuma grabbed his sword and slashed at Luffy's neck. The blade passed completely through Luffy's neck leaving behind a trail of sparks which confused Higuma, until he felt the horrible shock of several hundred thousand volts of electricity surge through his body as his steel blade acted as a conductor for Luffy's lightning. Higuma collapsed while twitching in agony. Never show your face in Fusha village again, jerk! Luffy yelled before kicking Higuma down the road several feet closer to the edge of the village. Higuma weakly started to crawl away from the village in terror of the child that couldn't possibly be human in his mind. Well, I guess this explains why no one came down to the docks to greet us. Shanks said as everyone turned to look at the pirate captain and his crew walking towards the bar. Shanks! You guys are back! Luffy called out with a grin as he waved to his friend. Ace and Sabo smiled as well from the doorway of the bar along with Makino. That was very impressive, Luffy. Shanks complimented the young boy as they walked into Makino's pub together. Protecting a friend is the best reason to fight someone else. I never let someone get away with hurting a friend of mine. I'm glad to see you're the same way. Shanks said with a grin which got Luffy to smile widely at the pirate captain. A few days later. So you guys are leaving now? Luffy questioned as he watched Shanks's crew prepare their ship for departure. Yeah, we've been here a while so it's time to move back to the Grand Line and the adventures there. Shanks responded as he watched his subordinates work. Aren't you gonna beg me to take you along again? Shanks asked with a grin at the boy. Nope, Ace and Sabo told me it would be cooler if I was the captain of my own crew and made a crew better than yours. Luffy replied with a smile. Ha! Huh. Like we'd take you with us anyway. You'll have to get a lot better to beat us, Luffy. Shanks laughed as he stuck his tongue out at Luffy. Oh yeah! You'll see. Just you wait. I'll gather the best crew ever. We'll beat you guys and then I'll find the One Piece. Then I'll be king of the pirates. Luffy yelled out loud causing laughter and cheers to erupt from Shanks' crew. Pirate king, huh? Well in that case, why don't you keep this hat safe for me? Shanks said as he took off his straw hat and put it on Luffy's head. This hat means a lot to me. Promise that you'll give it back to me someday, when you've become a great pirate. Luffy simply nodded as a few tears fell from his eyes. Within the next few minutes Shanks and the red-haired pirate set sail from Dawn Island and Fusha Village heading back towards the Grand Line. Don't be sad, Luffy. You'll see them again someday. Sable consoled his younger brother as they watched Shanks' ship disappear over the horizon. Yeah, we should probably thank him properly for giving you something so important to him. Maybe Makino can teach us those manners and stuff that she says we need. Ace said as he rubbed his chin in thought. Shishishishishi. Yeah, I'm definitely going to be king of the pirates. Then I'll return this hat to Shanks. Luffy laughed as the three brothers headed back to their hideout near Dayton's place to hang out. A month later. Luffy. Sabo and Ace stood on top of a hill looking over the area known as Great Terminal. Or at the very least whatever parts of it that weren't on fire yet. Someone had set fire to the entire Great Terminal area tonight, and the three boys could barely hear people yelling over the roar of the flames. What's going on? Luffy yelled as the brothers watched the fire burn. I don't know, Luffy. But this definitely wasn't an accident. Ace replied with a grimace as the flames spread farther. This is probably the work of the nobles in Goa. They've always despised the people who live in Great Terminal. Sabo ground out through gritted teeth. Hey, look, there's a ship in the cove. Luffy pointed out as a large ship docked near the shore. Not a minute later a small bright white light left the deck of the ship and a huge blast of air cleared out a large space at the edge of Great Terminal completely removing the flames from that area. 
What in the hell? Ace muttered in shock at seeing the display of power. Beside him Luffy and Sabo were also too shocked to speak. Several minutes later the large ship departed from the shore and disappeared into the darkness of the night. What was that about exactly? Sabo wondered out loud as Luffy and Ace shrugged unable to answer their brother's question. We should get back to Dayton's place. There isn't anything we can do here, Ace said before heading back into the forest towards Dayton's home. Luffy and Sabo stared at the large fire for a moment longer before following after Ace. After a week had passed since the burning of Grey Terminal, the three brothers had gone exploring the area again. Finding many survivors the three learned that the fire was caused by the nobles of Goa wanting to remove all the trash from their kingdom in an effort to look good for the visiting celestial dragons. Sabo could only grit his teeth in anger at being proven correct. This was the kind of thing that made him run away from his life as a noble's son. He truly despised how the nobles looked down on other human beings as mere trash. They also found out that it was the revolutionary army that had saved the majority of the people from burning to death in the fire. When Sabo heard about what the revolutionary army stood for, and their goal he was determined to one day join them and help them change the world. Later that night back at Dayton's compound Luffy brought up a fact that he thought was important. Ace, you need a hat, Luffy stated with finality, causing both of his brothers to look at him oddly. Why do I need a hat, Luffy? Ace questioned while Sabo looked between his two brothers. Because I have a hat and Sabo has a hat, you're the only one without one, Luffy said with a completely serious face. Sabo burst out laughing while Ace simply chuckled at Luffy's statement. Fine, I'll look for a hat I like all right. Ace replied with a grin causing both Luffy and Sabo to laugh at the thought of all three of them wearing hats all the time. Maybe something in orange? Ace pondered causing a new wave of laughter to come from his two brothers. Chapter 4 The Romance Dawn Ten years had passed since the red-haired pirates had set sail for the last time. The sleepy village of Fusha hadn't changed much in that time. There were periods of time where it was quieter than usual, mostly when Luffy, Ace, and Sabo were in the mountains with Dayton and her bandits. But beyond that, Shanks and his crew wouldn't have noticed a difference. But Shanks and the red-haired pirates never had returned, keeping to Shanks' promise of only meeting Luffy again when the kid had made it big. But today was the day Luffy was finally going to set out on his grand pirate adventure. There he goes! Makino waved joyfully at the rapidly shrinking boat on the horizon. She had a wide grin to contrast with Whoopslap's scowl. Looks like he finally left like he wanted. We're going to miss him. The old mayor growled. He's going to ruin this town's reputation. Makino rolled her eyes as she turned to go back to her bar in response. Out on the sea, Luffy was lazily lounging on his tiny little dinghy. He was wearing his treasured straw hat, an open, red cardigan with flared sleeves exposing his chest, and some blue jean shorts with cuffs. Luffy had grown well in the ten years since he'd last seen his hero. He was as tall as his brothers had been the last time he'd seen them at an even six foot. He wasn't quite as muscular, though, being a little bit slimmer than Ace and Sabo. Ah, the weather sure is great today! The new pirate exclaimed cheerfully as he spun his hat on his fingertip but the water bubbling nearby ruined the serene peace of the open ocean. Ha! Huh. Luffy opened an eye and plopped his straw hat back onto his head before grinning. Hey, you're pretty big. What rose up from the ocean was a large sea king which had terrified the many smaller vessels around Fusha for the last few years. So you're the jerk that moved in after Kazan froze the lord of the coast, huh? The sea king rose from the ocean, water dripping from its eel-like form. It snarled and started racing towards Luffy and his dinghy. The lightning man grinned as he stood up and faced the charging beast. Luffy raised his arm and extended two fingers forming the classic gun shape and aimed it towards the sea beast. Goro Goro no pistol! It happened in a flash, literally. One moment the sea king was charging towards Luffy, and the next a blinding light was passed through the air. The water crackled as it instantly began to produce ozone with the passing of the electrical beam. The Sea King didn't even have time to try and evade before the energy was upon it and piercing straight through its skull. It wobbled for a moment with a smoking, 
cauterized hole visible through its head before it collapsed to the water and began sinking. Luffy grinned widely. Shishishi, how was that, you stupid fish? His hat was shadowing his eyes as he raised the brim with one finger to watch the sea kings sink beneath the waves. He collapsed back down lazily before crossing his arms behind his head and started lounging totally carefree. Well, before I head to the Grand Line. He raised his arms into the air. I'll need some good friends. He laughed loudly. And then we'll get a ship and a flag. Then I'll become king of the pirates. The next day, Luffy again had a giant grin on his face. Man, what great weather again! He cheered. Who would have thought I'd get into such a problem on such a great day? And indeed, the absolutely massive, whirling spiral of water sucking in his tiny boat could certainly be described as a problem. Man, what a huge whirlpool! That was careless of me. His grin hadn't even dropped an inch, as if he was just talking about the nice weather and not the huge death spiral. He and I can't even swim. His face finally changed, a look of sudden recognition appearing. Wait, it wouldn't matter even if I could swim. And then the whirlpool swallowed the boat. Somewhat far away, a large ship sat in the gently rolling waves. A manicured hand with pearls around the wrist was seen running a finger across the railing. What's this? A dangerous, rough-sounding female voice was heard asking. Instantly, all of the men on the ship froze in fear. What is all this dust? She asked the shivering men. Ah, uh, I'm so sorry, Lady Alvida. I thought I had already cleaned the entire deck. I'll clean it again. So please don't. Don't what? She questioned, turning around. Please don't hit me with your ma. The man tried to say before he was cut off with a loud thud. The iron mace of Alvida crashed down onto the man's skull and crushed it. The pirate collapsed like a puppet with his strings cut and crashed to the deck. He didn't move again. Kobe! Alvida roared as she slowly turned around. The woman was very obese. She took up enough space for five men, and she carried around a massive, hulking slab of iron she called a mace. She was wearing a pink plaid shirt that was stretched taut over her frame, an equally tight pair of graying pants and a blue captain's coat. She had a white, red-plumed cowgirl hat and was covered in gaudy-looking jewelry. She had a flintlock tied to her by a purple sash to finish off the pirate look. All in all, she wasn't what most would call attractive, to say the least. The Kobe she was yelling for was a chubby, dorky-looking boy with a pink bowl cut. Why yes, Lady Alvida? Who is the most beautiful woman in the entire sea? She asked threateningly. Eh ah, that would oh of course be why you, Lady Alvida. Kobe shakily answered though internally he thought nothing could be farther from the truth. That's right, the large woman roared. And because of it, I don't want a single dirty thing on my entire ship. I don't want to see even a single speck of dust. She slowly turned to him again. The only reason you're still alive is because you're a decent navigator. She snarled at the terrified boy. Oh, of course, Lady Alvida. He cried piteously, not allowing any tears to escape. Other than that, you're entirely worthless. Now clean my shoes, Alvida demanded and thrust her large leg at the boy. Yes, Lady Alvida, Kobe nodded. After a few minutes of cleaning, he got a boot to the face. That's enough, trash, Alvida snarled. Go clean the washroom. And with that, she lost interest in the cowardly boy. Ha ha, I'll be on my way, Lady Alvida. As they all left him. His face turned down as he finally allowed a tear to escape. A few hours later, two sailors were lazily slumped over one of the railings of the cruise ship they were working on. They were just relaxing and looking out at the whirlpool they were passing by. The seagulls were cawing. It was calm and peaceful, other than the swirling hole in the ocean. Ha! Huh. Their attention was grabbed by a barrel hitting the side of the ship. The two sailors grinned at each other, and quickly grabbed a rope with a claw on it to hook the barrel. They each took turns trying to nail the barrel and failed on the first four attempts. The next sailor spun it mightily over his head and flung it downward with a roar of, Got it! But the claw was way off mark. 
The other sailor laughed at his friend's ongoing misfortune. Three strikes. You're out. Inside the opulent ship, a beautiful orange-haired woman wearing a nice, beige dress was staring out the window with her chin in her palm. Violin music was being played by the live band. The captain was currently reassuring one of the passengers that a whirlpool of the size they were passing wasn't even a worry to the ship. One young man came up to the orange-haired woman and asked for a dance, which she accepted with a smile. Outside, the men finally snagged the barrel with the claw and hauled it onto the ship. Awesome! This thing is heavy! Maybe it's full of booze! The larger sailor beamed. Their merriment was cut short by a horrified gasp from the sailor up in the crow's nest. Pee pirates! It's a pirate ship! Enemy raid! Enemy raid! The sailors gasped and ran off inside to alert the captain of the incoming raiders. The pirate ship, which had been painted pink of all colors, had a large red heart on the main sail, which was coming unfurled. Smoke erupted from the pink pirate ship as three large cannon balls flew towards the cruise ship. After a few seconds of flight they finally struck, all going wide of their target. Large geysers of water blew into the air and shook the cruise ship terribly. Inside, all of the passengers were screaming, panicking and running around frantically, all of course, except one. The orange-haired woman had widened her stance to keep her balance, and had her arms out to stabilize herself. Slowly, a wide smirk formed on her lips. On the enemy pirate ship, Alvita was smirking as they finally scored a direct hit and broke the dolphin figurehead at the front of the ship. Kobe! Who is the most beautiful woman in the entire sea? Why, you are, of course, Lady Alvida. Kobe stuttered. She laughed hoarsely. Well done. Kobe stammered his thanks. This will be our first good haul in a while. One of the men licked his lips. She grinned wider. Rough them up, good boys. Show them the terror of Lady Alvida. The ship turned slightly and fired with its forward-facing cannon, striking a direct hit on the main mast of the cruise ship. On the ship, the barrel the sailors had hauled and rolled down some steps and into the holds, finally rolling through an open door before stopping. Elsewhere on the ship, the orange-haired woman was running with an irritated grimace on her face. She really didn't want to damage her dress, so she was being forced to hold up the hem. She reached the door and broke out, turning right only to shiver and yelp as the much smaller pirate ship pulled up alongside the cruise ship. She turned tail and ran back into the ship, as the pirates threw their hooks and boarded the ship. What do you think you're doing, Kobe? Alvida noticed the boy shaking like a leaf and snarled at him for his hesitation. I am not really good at this. Kobe stammered at his captor. Alvida snarled and booted him in the behind. Don't backtalk me. Get your ass into gear. Kobe flew onto the deck of the ship and landed face first into one of the walls. He slumped to the floor and began sniveling. Alvida followed with her mace held high, terrifying Kobe with her large jump and the fact that she was going to hit him. He screamed like a little girl and scrambled out of the way allowing Alvida and her mace to plow right through the wall. Smoke, dust, and wood chips flew through the air for a few moments, before revealing a dazed Alvida sitting there. One of the pirates grinned menacingly at the passengers. We won't be taking your lives today, but we will take all your valuables. So start handing them over. Alvida shook herself and wandered over. Anyone who argues takes a nice swim in that whirlpool. Inside the ship, their raucous laughter was all the orange-haired woman could hear. She smirked and threw her fancy dress off, revealing another outfit underneath. A tight blue shirt, loose black pants with a red sash, and a black bandana covering her orange hair. A few minutes later, Kobe was checking about the ship in a frightened manner when he came upon a room with an open door. H. Hello? He poked his head in slowly. There was no one in the room. He sighed in relief as he entered before taking note of the large barrel that had knocked a bunch of stuff over off to one side. Man, what a large barrel! The pink-haired boy mused. Outside, the orange-haired woman had used one of the hook ropes the pirates had left behind to zip line over and board the ugly pirate ship. She swiftly moved to a door and looked around several times before reaching for the doorknob. Before she had even touched it, 
it sprang open and startled her greatly. She sprang back and took up a weird pose as the pirate looked her over. Hey, who are you? I don't think I've seen you before. The pirate leered at her with a growing grin as he leaned closer. She chuckled lightly before her weird pose turned into a strong kick. She planted her foot as hard as she could right between the man's legs. He would have let out a high-pitched squeal if he hadn't immediately choked on his tongue. Instead, he ended up collapsed on the deck, unconsciously holding his damaged groin. The Orangette smiled brightly and made her way into the ship after stuffing the body in an out-of-the-way corner. Below deck on the cruise ship, Kobe was struggling to move the barrel, rolling it over to the door. Hey, what are you sneaking around for Kobe? One of the other pirates questioned from behind him with a grin, scaring the boy. Ah, uh, I was just rolling this over to the ship. It's pretty heavy, Kobe exclaimed. The pirate grinned. Heavy, eh? That's good. Must be full of booze. He hauled it upright. And I was just getting thirsty. He licked his lips. We can't. Kobe yelled in shock. Lady Alvita will kill us. The pirate sneered as he raised his fist. Well, as long as you don't tell, she doesn't have to know. You just need to keep your mouth shut. He swung downward with a hard punch to break through the top of the barrel. But it wasn't his fist that broke through. Instead, a pair of fists burst upward right through the lid, one of which socked him in the jaw as a boy wearing a straw hat and a huge grin came up yawning. Man, what a great nap! I slept great! The thud of the pirate hitting the floor drew the young man's attention. Ha! Huh. He looked over to the unconscious man before looking oldishly at the other two pirates that were staring at him in shock. Who are you guys? The two sprang forward with shark teeth and roared at him. Who the hell are you? Luffy ignored them as he stepped out of the barrel. That guy is going to catch a cold if he sleeps on the floor, you know? Their eyes bugged out. You put him there. They both drew swords, and Luffy looked at them with a confused look. Do you even know who you're messing with, punk? We're pirates. Luffy simply ignored them, turning to Kobe. Hey, I'm hungry. You guys have any food? The pirate's eyes bulged out even more. Listen when people are talking. They both raised their swords in the air. You damn brat. They swung, eager to have their blades taste flesh. Kobe covered his eyes with his hands. The sound of blades hitting something was followed by two distinct thunks. Kobe slowly uncovered his eyes, steadying himself for the horrible sight he would no doubt witness. He gasped in shock and then started to stare. The boy's right arm was pointing left with a closed fist. The two swords the pirates had drawn were each broken with their tips stuck in the floorboards. But the pirates? They'd gotten off worse than their swords. They were both embedded up to their waists in the walls on the far side of the room, legs hanging limply from their holes. Kobe tried to speak. You, what, how? He stuttered. Who are you? Eh? Luffy turned to him. I'm Monkey D, Luffy. Nice to meet ya. He grinned. Kobe shook himself. You have to hurry. They're bound to wake up soon and if they come back with their friends you're dead. There's over thirty of them. Nah, I'm hungry. Got any food? Luffy shrugged before picking at his nose with a pinky. Kobe only gaped. How can you be so carefree? They're pirates. So? I'm a pirate too. Luffy grinned at Kobe's horrified face. I only just started out though. I was just setting sail for the first time when I accidentally got caught in a whirlpool. Shishishi. He laughed, before beginning to sniff at the air. Luffy started walking forward so Kobe grabbed him, trying to haul him away. No, not that way. There are dozens of them. You have to get out. But Luffy didn't even slow his stride as he dragged the pink-haired boy, dragging feet and all, through the nearest doorway. He grinned widely and doved down towards the food in the room. Kobe sighed as he noticed they were fairly well hidden down here. Actually, this room isn't that bad. They might not find us here. Luffy still wasn't paying attention. He was too busy stuffing his face full of food. You're Luffy, right? I'm Kobe. He started walking down the steps. That was incredible what you just did. How did you do it? 
Luffy turned around as Kobe reached him. These are great! He exclaimed holding up an apple while completely ignoring Kobe's question. He turned back around and continued to eat. Is this a pirate ship? No, this is a cruise ship the Alvida pirates are raiding. Kobe explained as he sat beside Luffy. Luffy paused for a moment, before continuing to stuff his face. Are there any boats on board? I kind of lost mine in that whirlpool so I need a new one. That sure was a surprise though. I never even saw it coming since it had been such a nice day. Shishishi. He chuckled around the food in his mouth. There should be. All ships have lifeboats, right? Kobe replied with a shaky smile as he watched the glutton eat. So you one of these pirates? Luffy asked. Kobe stiffened before trying to explain his situation. Not exactly. I wandered onto a boat to go fishing. He looked down. But it turns out that it was a dinghy belonging to Lady Alvita's ship. It's been two years since then. He held onto his knees. They made me a cabin boy in exchange for my life. Kobe finished morosely. It was silent for a moment, before Luffy started to chuckle. You're kind of an idiot. Who just walks onto a pirate dinghy? It seemed as if a huge weight suddenly appeared on Kobe's shoulders as he sagged down in depression. You're brutally honest. The pink-haired boy whined. Well, if you hate it and you want to leave, just leave. Luffy replied as he stretched his back out, a couple pops being heard. I couldn't, can't. No way. No way. Just thinking of Lady Alvida finding out terrifies me. I'm too scared. Kobe stammered even at the thought of doing so. Just this morning he'd seen what Alvida's mace could do. You're a coward too? Luffy laughed blowing yet another hole into Kobe's self-esteem. Man, I hate guys like you. Tears streamed down Kobe's face, and it almost looked like he was about to give up on life. He drew himself up and bowed forward morosely. Yeah, you're right. I'm a coward. If only I had the courage to be like you and drift in a barrel. He sighed. There's something I want to do too, hey, Luffy? What compelled you to go out to sea? Luffy grinned and pumped his fists into the air. I'm going to the Grand Line, of course. Kobe gasped. I'm going to be king of the pirates. Kobe's jaw dropped, and his pupils shrank. He was halfway into a panic attack and he was practically choking. I am possible. No way. No way. Pirate king? Are you serious? Yeah? Luffy shrugged nonchalantly. Got a problem with that? What about your crew? Kobe stammered. Don't have one yet. Luffy replied cheerfully. I just started out so I'm just now beginning to look. Kobe froze entirely, and even when Luffy stepped forward and waved his hand in the pink-haired boy's face he still didn't move. Pirate King is the title given to the one who obtains everything. The greatest treasures. Wealth. Fame. Power. With each word. Luffy nodded along. One piece. Yep. Luffy confirmed with a large grin. Pirates all over the world are after that treasure. Kobe screamed in shock. Me too, and I'll be the one to get it. Luffy wasn't bragging when he said that. It was just a statement of fact in his mind. No. Impossible. No way. No way. Absolutely no way. Kobe shook his head back and forth with his fists clenched. There's no way you can stand at the apex of this pirate era and scream that. No way, no wa. Luffy's fists collided with the younger boy's head stopping his rant. Shut up, you idiot. W, why'd you hit me? Kobe sniffled, clutching his aching head. Not like I'm not used to it by now. It's all right, I guess. He laughed and cried at the same time. It's not about whether I can or can't, Luffy said as he held on to his hat. I'm going to do it because I want to, he stated passionately. It's my dream. I'll become the Pirate King, or I'll die fighting for that dream. I don't care if I lose my life trying. He stood up and put his hat back on. Well, I'm full. I'm going to go find a boat now. W wait, Kobe yelled. Luffy! I have a dream, too. Do you think I can accomplish it if I stake my life on it? 
Do what? Luffy stopped walking and looked over at the cowardly boy. Do you think I can join the Navy? Luffy smirked. Catching bad guys is my dream. All traces of the stuttering were gone from the cowardly boy's voice. It's been my dream ever since I was little. Then do it. Luffy yelled and clapped Kobe on the back. Don't let others take your dreams away. Because if you don't fight for your dreams then who will? That's right. Kobe screamed. I'm not going to be a chore boy forever. He was working himself up into a frenzy at this point. I'm going to be a great marine and work tirelessly to catch criminals. And the first one I'm going to catch is Lady Alvida. No! Alvida! Just after Kobe's exclamation, the ceiling broke and all strength left the boy's body as Alvida's huge body landed behind him. Who did you say you were going to catch, Kobe? Kobe shook and trembled as Alvida's form was revealed by the clearing dust. Luffy blinked as he looked at the new woman with his head tilted to the side. Five swords burst through the wood behind him. Ha! Huh. He looked puzzled at the situation. Ha, huh, you don't look like Pirate Hunter Zoro to me. Alvida smirked at him, before locking her gaze onto the pink-haired boy. Kobe! Who is the most beautiful woman in the entire sea? She demanded. Th that would be. Kobe stammered and rubbed his head with a terrified smile. Hey, Kobe, who's this fat hag? Luffy asked while he picked his nose with his pinky. Jaws instantly dropped from both of the other occupants, as well as the men standing at the hole in the ceiling. Alvida stopped breathing for a moment, before she started to grind her teeth and tick marks started popping up all over her bloated face. You damn brat! She roared as she swung her massive mace up and over her head. Luffy grinned. In the blink of an eye his foot was on Alvida's head with Kobe, held by the face, along with him. Later, lard ass! With that, both he and Kobe were flying up through the large hole. Alvida's mace crashed onto the space her target had previously occupied throwing up dust and wood chips. The two landed on the deck, where the two trembling pirates Luffy had punched earlier were shaking. Stealing themselves, they drew new swords and charged with loud battle cries. Luffy tilted his head and was in front of them before they could blink, his fists warping their faces. Teeth and blood flew as they were both launched back across the deck, impacting the railings and falling right off the ship. Behind him a swordsman roared as he leapt into strike from above. Luffy sidestepped. Backstabs are for losers. He grabbed the man's face, slamming it into the ship's deck. Wood cracked, and splinters flew out of the new crater formed by the pirate's head. Ha! Huh. Luffy looked up and saw a dozen more pirates in front of him. Mass attacks aren't cool either, he yelled as he ran from the dozen pirates chasing him. He grinned in amusement as he led the group of men on a chase around the deck. Out of his peripheral vision, he noticed a woman in a blue shirt and bandana sneaking out of Alvita's ship with a large bag slung over her shoulder. He grinned even wider. That was pretty interesting. He spun before laughing. Just kidding! In a matter of seconds, well before any of the pirates even knew what hit them, they were all laid out on the deck with fist marks covering their bodies. Some had even been kicked off the deck and into the ocean. Shishishi. Luffy chuckled at his handiwork. A amazing! You took out all those tough pirates so fast! Kobe shivered in amazement. Tough? Those guys were weaklings. No challenge at all. Luffy thumbed his nose while grinning. Do you, do you think I could ever be as strong as you, Luffy? Kobe asked quietly. Not a clue. Luffy grinned. That's up to you, coward boy. That's so mean. Kobe slumped over, the word coward practically looming over him heavily. Suddenly another loud crash broke through the silence. Alvida had shown up again. So, you're not Pirate Hunter Zoro? I haven't seen you use a sword yet. The huge woman growled. Oh hey, the hag showed up again. Luffy stated while picking his nose once more. Kobe's jaw dropped while Alvita's face burned red in fury. El Luffy! Repeat after me! He grabbed the taller man's arm tightly. Lady Alvita is the most. Suddenly, images of his newfound friend started flashing through his eyes. Luffy's strength, his conviction, his lack of fear. The most. 
and then he saw himself. Abused, kicked around and terrorized. Kobe grit his teeth and turned to Alvida. The fattest, ugliest, most horrible bitch the sea has ever seen. He roared out in defiance. Luffy erupted into laughter at the boy's words. Alvida's teeth ground so hard they almost cracked. Kobe! She raised her massive mace in fury, ready to end the pink-haired shrimp in front of her. Kobe shuddered, but stared at his oncoming death with courage. I, I did it. I actually fought against her. He gulped and then screamed. I have no regrets. Luffy moved in front of the giant iron mace. Well said. His smile was stupidly wide as he backhanded the giant hunk of metal and shattered it into tiny pieces that scattered all over the deck. What? Alvida's eyes were bulging out of her head as she gasped in shock, mirrored by Kobe whose jaw also dropped. He knew Luffy was strong, but this strong? What in the world was Luffy? So long, hag! The smirking straw hat-wearing pirate formed a fist and nailed the hefty Alvida square in the stomach. The fat on her torso rippled out from the point of impact, like a shockwave forming on her stomach. She choked out as much of a gasp of pain as she could, before being lifted clean off her feet and launched away like a misshapen cannonball. She went tumbling through the air rapidly shrinking into the distance. A minute later, Alvida slammed into the ocean sending up a large spray of water just like an actual cannonball. Luffy grinned and held his fist up while clapping his other hand onto his bicep. He then glanced over to the remains of Alvida's crew who were just staring at him in shock. Luffy was about to demand a boat for him and Kobe when the entire ship shook. Two geysers rose up near the boat, caused by more cannon fire. Luffy grimaced as he noticed three marine battleships closing in. TCH! What are those idiots trying to do? He practically growled. What are they firing at? Gramps would have their hides for firing so close to a civilian ship. Glancing at Kobe, who was somewhere between awestruck and terrified, he decided that he needed to get out of Dodge. Remembering the woman who he'd seen sneaking away, he grabbed Kobe and threw him over his shoulder before jumping from the cruise ship over to the pirate vessel still anchored to it. He quickly raced off in the direction he could sense the girl in and noticed her securing her sack to a small boat in a panicked rush. With a leap he and Kobe landed in the boat, and the orange-haired woman shrieked in fear as she almost fell off from the sudden impact. Luffy quickly grabbed her and steadied her, making sure that she and her bag didn't fall off the small boat. Who the hell are you? She shrieked in surprise. We can talk after we're out of here. Shishishi. Luffy laughed for a moment before the boat rose on a swell from latest barrage of cannonballs. He turned hard eyes to the three marine vessels. Those idiots are going to hit the cruise ship too. With a scowl he placed his right foot back and held his two hands facing each other in front of his body. What are you do? The woman cut herself off with a squeak of fear as electricity began leaping between Luffy's hands. A literal ball of lightning began to rapidly grow in size as the smell of ozone filled the air. The electric charge in the air made Kobe and the woman's hair start to stand up, while the heat radiating from the ball had the both of them begin to inch away as far as they could get on the small dinghy. Luffy grinned and took aim. Goro Goro no cannon. He roared and thrust his hands forward. The bright ball of lightning rocketed forward at high speed, racing towards the three marine ships. But Luffy wasn't planning on killing anyone and hadn't been aiming at the ships. He was actually aiming at the ocean in between the three vessels. Instantly upon impact, the great ball of condensed lightning exploded, the top several meters of ocean water instantly turned to steam sending out a shockwave that sent the battleships rocking unsteadily on the sudden rough waters. When the large amount of water suddenly disappeared it left a deep void in the ocean. Water quickly rushed into this empty space and slammed together in the center. The resulting collision generated a huge wave that radiated outwards. The battleships were tossed up and down as the wave passed under them with panicking marines holding on to their ship for dear life. Shishishi. Luffy laughed at his success against the battleships, while turning to look at Kobe and the orange jet. That was way too much. The woman roared with shark teeth, almost hyperventilating as she saw the large wave approaching their tiny boat. You're going to hit us too. Oh right, 
the wave won't stop for a while. Luffy deadpanned as they were picked up and carried away by the wave. Kobe and the woman were grabbing onto the edge of the dinghy while screaming their heads off. You moron. The woman screamed in terror as she kept a white-knuckled grip on the side of the boat. I thought I was going to die. The orange jet whimpered as she cradled her bag of treasure. Kobe was staring blankly at the sky as if he had already accepted that he was dead. They had gotten away scot-free. The marines weren't following them, the sun was shining, and the sea was calm. She huffed, before smiling slightly. But hey, at least I got a lot of treasure out of it. She said the last part mostly to herself, though Luffy heard her anyway. Shishishi, that was fun. Luffy exclaimed before suddenly taking a fist to the head courtesy of an angry orange-haired woman. Ow. Oh, what was that for? You almost got us killed. She screamed in a demonic tone, shaking her smoking fist in front of him. She slumped over and lounged back on her bag. I'm Nami. She introduced herself sweetly, all traces of anger gone. Luffy grinned. I'm Monkey D. Luffy. The wimpy-looking guy is Kobe. The pink-haired, wimpy-looking guy slumped down in depression. Nami smiled and gave him a high five. Well, you certainly secured our getaway, even if it was terrifying. She glared, her mood seeming to flip-flop again. Don't do that again. And then she was all smiles again. Still, you are pretty strong. She praised brightly. Shishishi. I worked hard. Luffy confirmed, slapping a hand onto his bicep. Nami smiled and leaned over, exposing her cleavage a tiny bit more. Luffy's eyes didn't move to take a peek, which disappointed Nami a little as she felt rightfully proud of her looks. I'm a thief who steals from pirates. She exclaimed, I could use a strong guy like you helping me. I'm the best damn navigator in the East Blue and I'd definitely like some strong people helping me to take treasure. She grinned. You wanna be partners? Nah, not interested. Luffy replied, slumping back against the edge of the dinghy. Nami's smile dipped at the instant refusal. Ah, come on, don't be like that. We could get a lot of money, she said enticingly. Luffy ignored her and stared out across the open ocean. Oh, fine. She muttered to herself and crossed her arms under her generous bust. So, what are you out on the sea for? Kobe, who had finally recovered, started sweating heavily. Please don't be an idiot. Please don't be an idiot. Just don't say it, he repeated in his head over and over again. Only Luffy's wide smile was visible from under his straw hat. He pumped a fist up. I'm going to be king of the pirates. He declared loudly. To the self-proclaimed pirate thief, who rapidly became the furious-looking, self-proclaimed pirate thief. So, you're a scumbag pirate, are you? Nami hissed. Everything in this damn era is pirate this and pirate that. I hate it. She pointed at Luffy angrily. I hate pirates. I should just toss you overboard. Kobe gaped at the orange jet, wondering if she was insane. Hadn't she just witnessed what Luffy was capable of? Luffy looked at Nami so seriously that she started to sweat, quickly getting over her anger and remembering what he'd done earlier. You can't do that. Luffy spoke calmly still looking Nami in the eye. Putting on a brave face even as she tried not to tremble, Nami replied. Oh? And why not? Luffy stared at her intensely, like he was looking into her soul. Nami started feeling even more unnerved. Because I'll die, Luffy stated plainly. Nami and Kobe both face faulted into the wooden floor of the boat with loud crashes. This guy is a moron. Nami muttered to herself as she pinched the bridge of her nose. Shishishi! Luffy laughed, seeing their reactions. Why would you die? Can't you swim? Nami asked after getting back to her position leaning on her bag of treasure. I ate a devil fruit! Nami and Kobe both looked shocked at Luffy's claim. I'm a lightning man! Shishishi! Luffy laughed at their stupefied faces. Wait! Wait! Wait. You mean those things actually exist? I thought they were just a myth. Nami stammered in shock. Though that would explain what you did back there. She trailed off remembering Luffy's display of power earlier. 
Oh, they're real all right. Luffy chuckled. Me and my two older brothers were each given a fruit by a strange guy we met one day. He smiled with a thoughtful look, remembering the day ten years ago. I didn't think anything about it at the time since I was hungry. But Gramps came back in a panic about it, and then we learned what we'd eaten. He laughed. They taste super bad, though. It was like someone had taken a pineapple, made it super sour, let it start rotting and then dumped it into filthy, stagnant water. It also left this odd tingling sensation in my mouth along with the bad aftertaste. Yuck! Nami and Kobe turned green from the description alone. Luffy occasionally saw Ace in the papers at Makino's bar. He was the captain of the Spade Pirates for two years with a bounty of two hundred million berry and the epithet Fire Fist. But in the last year Ace had apparently joined up with Whitebeard and his bounty had risen to five hundred million berry. Sabo had set sail to find the Revolutionary Army. From the vague letters he'd sent back to Luffy, three in total over the last three years, he'd found them and was working to free the world of the influence of the world nobles, the Tenryubito. Sabo had managed to stay out of the Marines' notice so far. He didn't yet have a wanted poster or a bounty on his head. Luffy wasn't sure if that was intentional or not, but knew that when Sabo did reveal himself he'd probably be marked with a high bounty. He wouldn't be surprised if it rivaled Ace's current bounty. Too bad for his brothers that he would soon have the biggest bounty between all of them. Luffy was hoping to start by beating Ace's starting bounty of 55 million berry. Nami shook the nauseating thought away before asking, Wait, so you just ate some random fruit that a stranger gave you? Are you stupid? She sighed before shifting the topic back to the devil fruits themselves. Even though most people think they're just legends, I've still heard that a single devil fruit can be sold for hundreds of millions on the black market. But I just never thought they were real, otherwise I definitely would have been hunting for them myself. She whispered, I could have been done by now. Yeah, that's what Shanks told me. Nami and Kobe gaped in disbelief at hearing the name of Iyanku. Luffy grinned at them, seeing the shock in both of their eyes. Not all pirates are scumbags, you know. We were all good friends. Me, Ace, and Sabo even had a lot of parties with Shanks and his crew. And before they left for good, Shanks acknowledged my dream and told me they'd be waiting for me in the Grand Line. He looked up at the sky. I miss them sometimes. He stated before pulling his hat over his eyes and drifting off to sleep, not seeing the look in Nami's eyes. She turned her head away, not wanting Kobe to see her clenched teeth and the unshed tears in her eyes. After all, what could you say to statements that shattered your worldview so completely? What could you respond with when you realized that you just had the worst luck? Hours later, Luffy awoke slowly and noticed it was already the dead of night. The boat was calmly sailing onward and both of the other two members of the boat seemed to be asleep. Kobe was sleeping like the dead curled up on one side of the dinghy, while Nami was shivering and trying to snuggle into her bag of treasure. Luffy smiled and took off his cardigan before moving over to her. He draped the garment over her shivering form in an attempt to keep her warm. He turned to get back to his spot, when he heard her voice behind him. You're pretty brave, sleeping like that near someone that threatened to drown you. He turned and stared at Nami, who apparently had been awake. Despite her hatred of pirates, she was still cold, and the day's earlier conversation had shaken her. So she continued to hold the warm cardigan like a blanket over her body. Luffy grinned back before replying. You don't seem like a bad person. She averted her eyes. You've had some bad things done to you by pirates, haven't you? She completely looked away from him at that. He sat right beside her. I hate pirates like that too, he said seriously, getting Nami's eyes to snap up and meet his. Picking on the weak, hurting people, hurting their nakama. He growled, heckles raised high. I hate bastards like that too. That's not what being a pirate is about. Of course it is. That's how all pirates are. Nami sneered, but it was half-hearted. Luffy grinned back. Sure they are. Next, I suppose you'll tell me all Marines are good and honorable people, right? He chuckled at the woman. You saw what those Marines did back there. He pointed his thumb back in the direction they came from. They just started firing away, 
They didn't even care if they hit the cruise ship. Anything is acceptable to catch pirates, right? Absolute justice and all that. Nami looked away, biting her lip. He sighed and scooted over. You shouldn't judge everyone just because of what some do. I mean, yeah, there are a whole lot of pirates out there destroying things and giving the rest of us a bad name. But that's not every pirate. He shook his head. Those types will never make it anywhere. They're the ones who end up bully others to make themselves feel strong. To try and make up for the fact that they aren't getting anywhere. With that, Luffy laid back where he had originally been, pulled his hat back over his eyes and was out like a light. Nami stared in his direction for a moment, before pulling his cardigan over herself and trying to fall asleep with her mind whirling with all the things Luffy had said that day. That is the end of this part like and subscribe. Bye.